This is level one of the CFA program, the topic on equity investments and the reading on market organization and structure. Ah, we are now moving into this topic of equity investments and we're going to have really good conversations on some complex material. This is truly an introductory reading. What we're going to learn in this reading is all of the basic foundation. And so this is one of those readings that I think the LOSs are probably not going to appear just by themselves on an exam question, but tied in to something that we're going to do in even more detail uh, in these future readings. Let me, sh let me show you what I mean. So explain functions of financial systems. Let's talk about classification of assets, major types of securities and intermediaries and positions. Those, so that sounds an awful lot like, okay, we're going to, we're going to get out our gloves and we're going to put a brick here and a brick, a brick here and brick. We're going to lay the foundation so that you can understand what that foundation is so that we can leapfrog up into more advanced questions. But nevertheless, notice that these action words explain and describe and compare. These are foundational um, in general. Notice that last one there. We will have to do some calculations and I'll show you how easy those are uh, somewhere in the middle of the slide deck. And then we'll spend a, a few moments on things like different types of orders, what is execution? What does validity mean? And then how do we clear these transactions? Because in, in a simple sense, if I have a financial asset and I want to sell it to you, I mean, the easiest way for us to do this would just be to meet on the street, right? And I could say, all right, here's the security. You pay me a certain amount of cash. But of course, it doesn't work that way because you and I, we don't know each other. And not only do we not know each other, you know, there are hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions. I mean, you think about these large companies out there like Procter & Gamble, they have billions of outstanding common shares. So we need a general meeting place. And that's what really that first uh uh, uh, LOS was all about. Explain the main functions of the financial system. It, it's really uh, a function of getting us all together in a common place where we can try to agree on a market clearing price. So let's take a look at that first one here. This is super simple. I bet you don't even need me to go over these main functions of the financial system to help people achieve their purpose. What does that mean? Well, we all have jobs, right? And so we get an income and we have a choice with that income. We can either we can either go out and spend it or or we can save it. Now, the really cool thing about this, I want to skip down to that orange block point down at the bottom, is that when we decide to save and maybe we decide to layer that saving with some borrowing, we have this capital. And so the, the main function of the financial system is to allocate that capital to its most efficient use. Let me give you a quick example. Let's suppose that I'm a super wealthy individual. Maybe I'm the most wealthy individual in the world. You know, what might I do with my tens of billions of dollars of capital? Well, I, I might go ahead and design a spaceship and shoot it up uh, into the atmosphere. Or I might uh, invest heavily and take over uh, an automobile company. Or, or I might uh, go ahead and buy Twitter. And so the question then becomes, how does the financial system allocate me as the most uh, wealthy person in the world? How do I allocate my resources to their most efficient use? And that's why the CFA Institute asks us as good financial analysts and candidates to go through a macroeconomics and a microeconomics set of readings so that we know about efficiency from an allocation standpoint and from an informational standpoint. And then somewhere locked in the middle is this uh, notion of when borrowers and lenders get together, they have to agree to trade. And when they agree to trade, they agreed they agree on a price. Maybe it's a price of a financial security. Maybe it's the total market value of Twitter. But what ultimately ends up is a interest rate. And that's what we're trying to do is establish 
interest rates so that we can determine what are reasonable rates of return so that we can plan on things like retirement. We can plan on things like paying for our children's education. We can plan on things like building a swimming pool in our backyard in three years or five years or seven years. So notice what we have in bolded down there, an equilibrium interest rate. Equilibrium means that uh, neither party, neither the borrower nor the lender, uh, was forced into the transaction. Uh, they went into the transaction of their own equal opportunity trying to get the best rate possible. All right, how about different classes of assets and markets? Uh, let's see, financial assets, of course, these are stocks and bonds, securities. These are uh, currencies like the US dollar and the Canadian dollar, and then contracts. And we'll talk about forward contracts and futures contracts, at least introductorily. Is that a word here in this reading? But man, we'll spend tons and tons of time on derivatives throughout, uh, throughout the CFA program. Physical assets, of course, are those assets that you can, uh, you know, that you can wrap your arms around physically. Like uh, uh, those of you who have been paying attention to some of my previous videos, what's my favorite commodity? The honey crisp apple. You know, can you bite into that honey crisp apple? But commodities include energy and orange juice and all those kinds of things. Uh, plus real assets, you know, like land and buildings, et cetera, et cetera. Now, markets, on the other hand, they can be classified based on the timing of delivery. You know, for example, the spot market, which is really the current market, um, that really means that you're going to trade either immediately or probably within one or two business days. But a forward market might be a market that you're going to agree to trade in 30 days or 60 days or or 50 years. I mean, I, you know, you and I could agree to trade. Here, let me lean up and get my favorite financial calculator. You guys see me put this... Uh, uh, on the camera regularly, we could agree to trade this thing 50 years from now. We could sign a, a forward contract and you could agree to pay me. Let's see, what do you think the inflation is for the HP 12C? I don't know, maybe it's 100% uh, over 50 years. Maybe it's 1,000%, but uh, timing of delivery, that's one classification. Um, who the seller is, maybe it's a government body, maybe it's a corporation, or maybe it's a wealthy individual. And then you can classify securities based on maturity. You know, you can you can go down to your local commercial bank and make a deposit and you could go back tomorrow and withdraw that deposit. So the maturity of that instrument would be one day or um, you could be a company like Disney, who in the 1990s issued a 100 year bond. And then types of securities, and those are equity securities and fixed income securities. So let's dive a little bit more into this classification of markets. So timing of delivery. Notice what we have there. Go to the second error point. So spot markets, that's what I was saying. Immediate delivery, but some spot markets allow for delivery uh, within two business days. But other markets, and look at the futures and forward and options markets, uh, these are known as derivative markets. And so what we're going to agree, that's what we did with my calculator in the forward market, uh, and we can, we can do this at some time, at some time in the future. Now, two different types of markets in terms of the identification of the seller. Uh, a primary market, uh, this is the market in which the financial security or the financial asset is created. And so the funds flow directly uh, from the purchaser of the security, which are regular old investors like you and me, to the issuer, you know, like the Treasury Department here in the United States or a corporate a corporation when they issue a bond or a corporation when they issue shares of stock. But then, then when those securities pass through the primary market, to investors out there, then sooner or later, those investors are going to want to get their money back. And you can't go back to the issuer. You can't go back to the Treasury Department and say, hey, I want my money back uh, before maturity. Or you can't go to a company like Procter & Gamble and say, hey, do you remember me? I lent you uh, $10,000 in an equity purchase five years ago, and I, I want my money back. It's now worth $20,000. Well, they'll say something like, you know what, go somewhere else. And that somewhere else is the secondary market. And of course, the most famous secondary market uh, in the world is the New York Stock Exchange. So notice what the, the reading tells us. These are funds that flow between and among investors. 
So money markets are those securities that mature in one year or less. Capital markets are those that mature in over one year. Traditional securities are pretty much fixed income securities and equity securities and then the alternative markets. And it's really fascinating. You know, I went through the CFA program 20 years ago or so. And, you know, the alternative readings were about this big and now they're about this big. And I think the alternative readings uh, offer us some really exciting opportunities for conversations. In fact, in my investments class, both the undergraduate and the graduate class, I have my, restu my students go and find all different sorts of alternative investments. And so those include, include things like hedge funds and commodities and probably commodities through a futures market, you know, real estate, leases and equipment. And we had great conversations about in financial statement analysis uh, readings about leases. And of course, collectibles. I'll go ahead and give you a good image uh, about a collectible. Years ago, as I was uh, fooling around on eBay, I came across the swimming suit that James Bond wore in that great movie, 2006 Casino Royale, and it was selling for $18,000. And I thought, wow, why don't I buy that for $18,000 and, uh, and see how much that appreciates over time? Uh, there's your homework assignment. Go on eBay and see if you can find the Daniel Craig uh, bathing suit uh, for sale and uh, and see if it's not 36,000 or or 118,000. You know, the point is that these alternative markets and the alternative investments provide great opportunities to complete the spanning of investments for our clients, comma, comma. Look at that last sentence. However, alternative assets are more difficult to value, right? How can you assign a value to a, a pair of swimming trunks that was worn by a famous actor in a movie? Uh, they're illiquid, right? They don't trade every day. They might not trade every year. They might trade every 10 years. And then here, here's the cool thing, it require investor due diligence. If you're gonna spend $18,000 on a swimming suit, you better make sure that it was uh, actually the suit that was worn by by Daniel Craig. I think there's a really famous story out there. Uh, the great comedian Steve Martin, he bought a painting. Boy, I wish I knew who, who the uh, who the artist was, but it was a forgery. And uh, Steve Martin lost a bunch of money on that. All right, how about types of securities? Let's start with the, the bonds. So fixed income securities. Remember, I've said this before, especially in the financial statement analysis readings, that when a, a, a business or the government issues a fixed income security, they're making an explicit promise. So look at that first tier teardrop point. I promise to pay interest and I promise to pay principal. We can classify them as either short term or intermediate term or long term. Here's a good illustration and a table of different fixed income instruments. So uh, bonds typically have maturities of more than 10 years. Uh, notes have maturities of, you know, usually three or five or seven years. A lot of times if you read about this in the Wall Street Journal or you do any research on uh, intermediate term uh, fixed income securities, they'll call them uh five-year debentures. You usually don't see the term debenture when it's a bond, although it, it applies to uh, really almost any fixed income security. And then some bonds can be converted to shares of stock. Those are called convertible bonds. And then over on the right, these are, uh, these are short-term investments. Switching then over to the uh, title of this topic, right? Equity securities. So what do we know about the bottom right hand side of the balance sheet? This represents the ownership in the business. And so what does that mean? It means that the shareholders have a claim on the earning stream. But I'm going to go ahead and make a bold comment here. The shareholders have a claim on the cash flow stream generated by the uh, corporation because remember, and I've done this before, the uh, net income, it can be massaged or it can be outright manipulated. We had those conversations in a previous recording, but cash flow is less able to be massaged or manipulated, although, although it can be. But just remember that those common shareholders, they have a right to the profitability of, of the business. So there are common shares, there are per preferred shares, 
and there are warrants. So the common shareholders, they are the true owners of the business. They have the right, they have the right to receive any dividends that are paid by the board of directors, and it's the shareholders who elect uh, the board of directors. Preferred stock, I have almost nothing interesting to say about preferred stock. Uh, mostly because there's really nothing interesting about preferred stock. Lots of good financial analysts just think of preferred stock as kind of like a quasi fixed income security because most preferred stocks out there pay a fixed dividend, which looks at least a little bit like a, a fixed coupon payment. Uh, but there are some things that the reading emphasizes that I would probably memorize for the exam. No voting rights. They have priority over common shareholders in terms of uh, maybe the dividend, but at least in uh, liquidation. And then remember that we uh, we talked about this back here. Where, where were we? With fixed income instruments. I mean, sometimes corporations issue uh, a bond that has a warrant attached to it. Sometimes it issues preferred stock that has a warrant attached to it. And this gives, uh, this gives the owner of the warrant the right to buy shares of common stock at an exercise price, sometimes at a discount. But you know, over time, hopefully the stock price goes up and then these warrants, uh, these warrants have value. A lot of times people say the warrants detach from the security and then they can trade out there. Sometimes they're uh, not able to be detached. Uh, I want to say something here about a poison pill, uh, but I'm not going to. I will save that conversation to our to our uh, merger and acquisition conversation. So, all right. How about pooled investments? Notice what we have in the two teardrop points: uh, shared ownership, which means exactly what the name suggests. We pool some funds to create one larger financial security. So each pool has a whole bunch of stuff in it. And look at the second uh, teardrop point, shares, units, depository receipts, or LP interests. And so here are some examples of pooled investments. I'm guessing you guys know all about mutual funds, although we'll talk at length about them in a future reading. We'll talk about uh, ETFs. We'll talk about them in a future reading. So remember, the mutual funds are just kind of diversified portfolios. Exchange traded funds are diversified portfolios that trade on exchanges. And so that's pretty much the difference between those first two. And then it gets even more interesting as we move over to the right. Let's skip over uh, to the hedge funds uh, pooled investments example. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a two quick uh, items here. Let's suppose I'm Jim and I'm a mutual fund manager and I say to you, hey, you guys, send me your money. Send it to me today. Send it to me tomorrow. And I'm going to invest in this kind of stuff. Whenever you want your money back, I'm happy to send it back to you. All right. That's that's kind of an open ended mutual fund. And I have to be pretty specific in what kind of investments I make. And I have to tell you what I'm investing in. A hedge fund, on the other hand, has much less uh, oversight and regulation. So if I'm Jim, the hedge fund manager, I'm going to say, send me your money. And, and by the way, if you only have two or five or ten thousand dollars, go somewhere else like a mutual fund. I'm going to say, look, you better send me a bunch of money, like a million dollars or ten million dollars. And, and by the way, and by the way, when you send me that ten million dollars, if you want it back next week, you're out of luck. I'll send it back to you maybe in five years or three years and 10 years. And by the way, I'm going to invest in these general kinds of things. And I don't have to tell you what those general kinds of things are before I do it. I'll tell you afterwards and you'll be able to see. I mean, there's transparency in hedge funds, but it's kind of a lagged transparency. And so what do people think? General investors and good financial an analysts tend to think that professionally managed limited partnerships probably have a better chance to generate higher returns. And that's the attraction of the hedge funds. And so the wealthy investors are willing to put up with, you know, the little idiosyncrasies that I just described in return for uh, higher returns. And then asset backed securities. These are really cool things. Of course, I'm guessing that you guys lived through the 2008 uh, financial crisis. And uh, one of the big causes of that financial crisis were these things called mortgage backed securities in which a financial institution like a bank takes a bunch of mortgages or a bunch of credit cards or a bunch of automobile loans, 
puts them all into a pool and says, hey, these things are for sale. And so they sell them to somebody out there. And so they raise uh, some capital to provide uh, an efficient flow of funds. What did I say earlier? You know, back into the commercial bank or the investment banker, whoever it is. And then you and I can buy these asset backed securities. So it gives us a way to have exposure to credit cards or automobile loans or uh, home loans. We have great conversations about that in future in future readings. Uh, currencies, we have the spot rate of exchange. So that's exactly like what we talked about the current markets just a few moments ago. So the rate of exchange is called the spot rate. And those are trades that are generally set settled in two business days. And these are foreign currencies. Commodities, precious metals, energies, industrial metals, agricultural products. Uh, here's uh, here's your homework assignment. I, I just gave my derivative securities class uh, just this week uh, an assignment in which they had to go um, uh, take a position in an orange juice futures contract. So your homework assignment is to go watch that great movie with uh, Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy called Trading Places. And uh, now remember, this is an adult movie, so there's a little bit of language in there and there's some people that uh, show up in their birthday suits. So if, uh, let's make sure we're all adults in the room. But boy, Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd are super fun in this movie and they make a ton of money in the end by trading orange juice futures contracts. It's really a great movie to learn a valuable lesson about taking a position in a derivative contract. Uh, real assets include things like real estate and airplanes. I, I had a, a, one of my neighbor friends that I grew up with as, uh, as a little dude. Uh, he was an entrepreneur. And one day he came home when he was still in college and he said, guess what I did today? And uh, I said, I have no idea. And he said, I bought a post office in the next town over there. And uh, he bought the post office and the federal government uh, agreed to pay him uh, 20 years uh, of a lease. So it was, it was guaranteed fixed income for 20 years. And of course that fixed income, uh, went up every year. So real estate machinery, boy, lumber stands. I mean, these are all kinds of fun stuff in there. Notice what we have put in that bottom embedded point. The reason that commodities and real assets and alternative investments in general are popular is because they have low correlations to, uh, to, uh, fixed income securities and equity securities. Yeah, here's what I was talking about earlier. Contract is an agreement among investors to do something in the future. And so these are mostly derivative contracts like a forward contract, a futures contract and, uh, and a swap contract. And we have multiple readings on derivative securities. So there's a forward contract. That's just, we agreed to trade on a, uh, uh, an asset, whether it's a physical or a financial asset at some time in the future, a futures contract is nothing more than a standardized forward contract. Look, we have that right in the definition there, a standardized forward contract. So there's tremendous liquidity in the futures market. So that's really a great question. Futures markets, lots of liquidity, forward markets, hardly any liquidity. Swap contracts, all we're going to do is we're going to agree to exchange payments like a fixed payment for a variable payment uh, and then an option contract. This is really cool because an option contract gives us the right, but not the obligation to trade at a fixed price at some time in the future. So I tell my students this all the time. In fact, I told them just this morning uh, when I was teaching them about some currency options that an option gives you the right to do something but it also gives you the right to do nothing. And that's why option contracts sometimes uh, can have high prices. Think about how valuable it would be just to have the right just to do nothing. Even if that right is just to not get out of bed and go to work in the morning, you can just, you can just stay in bed and sleep uh, without having any penalty. All right, how about some uh, intermediaries? So a broker really is just somebody who walks around and says something like, oh, you want to buy? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's walk around some more and here's somebody who wants to sell. Let's get you two together. Uh, notice what it says. Agents who fill orders for their clients. 
uh, helping to reduce their client's transaction costs. So when I was describing that walking around, it's probably not walking around the streets, you know, like you might find at, uh, at a farmer's market, but walking around inside a large financial institution trying to find clients. One client wants to buy, one client wants to sell. And of course, some of these uh, provide the services for large traders. So those are called block brokers. Uh, investment banks, these are financial institutions that uh, do lots and lots of stuff, but you know their two main functions are helping organizations like a corporation and like a government uh, organization to borrow money. So notice what it says here. They issue a wide range of securities, common stock, preferred stock, bonds, and any kind of uh, security out there. And then, of course, on the other side of that is that they have a retail client base that they can, they can sell. They can sell these securities to that client base. And, of course, we need a place to meet. So I'm hoping that as soon as you see the word exchange, you think of the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Oops, I went one too far. And there are alternative trading systems. And so these things, they function almost like the New York Stock Exchange, but uh, they allow their members or their subscribers to behave in lots of different ways that are less restrictive than maybe the New York Stock Exchange is. And then there are dealers. You know, I always think of a dealer of as somebody who walks around with two pockets. And in one pocket, they have an inventory of stocks or bonds. And in the other pocket, they have cash. And so they fill their clients' orders. So sometimes if clients are doing lots and lots of selling, right? So then the, the dealer then is going to have a huge pocket full of an inventory and little cash over here. And then just, just the opposite. Uh, insurance companies, you know, insurance companies, hedge risks, you know all about car insurance and life insurance and homeowners insurance and health insurance. Arbitragers, we're going to have fascinating conversations about arbitrage when we talk about derivative securities and uh, equities and fixed income securities. Arbitragers are those that have the opportunity to, are you ready for this? Have no investment of their own take no risk, but find a positive return. And then clearinghouses are those organizations that keep track of all the stuff that's going on so that the end of a hectic trading day, or even at the end of a non-hectic trading day, someone is keeping score. And that's pretty much what the uh, clearinghouse corporations or the clearinghouses do. Here's the story that I tell my students about securitization. Let's suppose that I'm a financial institution, Jim's Bank, and I have made all of these mortgage loans. And these are 30-year mortgage loans. So what I have to do every day is I have to get up and I have to decide who owes me money this day or this month. And I got to get in my car and drive down to their house and knock on their door and say, where's your monthly payment? It includes interest in principal. And I got to do that for 30 years, right? So that, that really... Uh, wears on financial institutions after time. So this is what happens. I go in and I pull these mortgages. I pull mortgage one and mortgage two and mortgage 50 and mortgage 100 and maybe mortgage, uh, mortgage 5,000 or whatever it is. I pull these things and then I sell them. And so what that means is I am securitizing these mortgages. I sell them to, you know, maybe a pension fund, maybe a mutual fund, maybe a hedge fund, or maybe some super wealthy investor. Now, what that means is that then when I sell those pools of mortgages or any other financial security that I can, that I can package, I, I get my money back today and I can use that to lend out to more and more uh, borrowers. And so look at that second embedded point there. For example, mortgage banks commonly originate hundreds of residential mortgages and then they place them in a pool and sell them. And so what happens is that those homeowners then, they pay interest in principal, right? And then they pass through, can you guys see my hand? They pass through and they go right over to, well, whoever bought uh, that mortgage-backed security, the resulting security after the securitization process. 
So here's a little bit of a more specific example. The illustration up top tells you exactly what I just said, but sometimes a firm may set up a special purpose entity, or sometimes it's called a special purpose vehicle, which they throw the assets into this SPV, and that SPV then acts as its own entity, which means it can it can issue bonds or it can take out loans, it can it can borrow money, and boy. Look at that last sentence we have there. That usually increases their value by removing the risk, that financial trouble, blah, 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 whatever. You know, whatever that means, just think of Enron. Enron had uh, tons and tons of these uh, special purpose entities. Uh, these are called off balance sheet financing, and we'll have great conversations about this at a later time. All right, how about the LOS that asks us to compare positions? And so this is what you need to know. Typically, when we go to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, we want to buy low and sell high. Well, of course, everybody knows that. Even your little brothers and sisters know that that's the goal to generate a capital gain. But the terminology is such that you need to know that when you buy shares on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, you buy them first and then you sell them second. That's known as the long position. And the long position always benefits when prices rise. Now, of course, if there is a long position, there's probably uh, a short position. And this occurs when an investor sells first and they sell an asset that they do not own. And then they hope that the price falls and then they buy it back later. So the short position benefits when the prices fall. Long position benefits when the prices rise. Now, Typically on the New York Stock Exchange, you can go and you can take the long position, right? You need cash to buy these shares of stock, but you can short stocks as well. And I bet you guys know this, or at least most of this. What you do is you borrow that share of stock from somebody who owns the share of stock. You borrow it, then you go to the New York Stock Exchange and you sell it. So you sell something that you don't own, but you still owe that share of stock to whomever you borrowed it. So what happens? The price falls, you buy it back, and then you return that share to the person who has always owned it, right? You just borrowed it. And so what did you do? You bought low and you sold high, but you did it in reverse order. You sold first and, and you bought second. Now, long and short positions have much greater meaning and application inside of the derivative markets, especially the futures markets. We typically don't say we're going to go and buy a futures contract or sell a futures contract. We typically say we're going to take the long position or the short position. But I think at this early stage in the readings that if you remember, long position benefits when prices rise, short position benefits when prices fall. Uh, you'll probably uh, be able to answer all those questions. And here's an illustration that tells us here. A short seller creates a short position by borrowing security. So there we go. We sell high at the blue triangle and then the price drops and we buy low at the green triangle. Uh, and so here's an interesting point. If there's a dividend paid in between there, the short position owes the original owner the, the dividend payment. Now, most times when we show up on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, we take cash. So if we want to buy $10,000 worth of common stock, we have $10,000 in our pocket. We pay $10,000 and we get the, uh, however many shares of stock that it is. That's, that's, called a, uh, uh, that's called a cash account. But sometimes we don't have $10,000. Sometimes we want to borrow some of that money. And this is called a margin account, which requires a margin loan. So we borrow some money. And we can do this from a financial institution. You know, the reading emphasizes that brokers out there do this all the time. Uh, and what we do is we borrow this capital and then we purchase the securities. Now, let me give you just a quick history lesson that, uh, you know, back in, let's say, 1928, are you guys old enough to know what happened in 1929? So if I go back to 1928, uh, some wealthy investors were able to show up on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with just 5% cash and borrow 95% in a margin loan. So if you have all this borrowing going on, you know, what happens? You know, prices are being bid up and there has to be, 
wait a minute, what happened in 1929? The stock market crash was for a variety of reasons, but because margin uh, accounts were way out of control. And so nowadays, um, you can get a margin loan by putting up, you know, 40%, 50%, 60%, really depends on your relationship with your investment banker. And so what the Institute wants you to be able to do is take a look at uh, this leverage ratio. So look down in the bottom box. Leverage ratio is just total value of the position over the equity value of the position. And that equity value just means how, how much cash did you put up? And then the maximum leverage ratio is going to be one over whatever that initial margin requirement is. And look at the third pill point there, margin requirement on the first day of the transaction on which the margin funds must be deposited. So let's work through, uh, let's work through a quick example. So notice the second row there, purchase price per share is $50 today. And then look at the very bottom, stock price after one year is $55. So if we had a cash account, we would have bought at 50 and sold at 55. That would have given us a 10% rate of return. But notice what the question asks us for down at the bottom. We wanna look at the maximum leverage ratio uh, and the investor's return on the margin account. So we have a thousand shares. Notice in there, there's an annual dividend. The initial margin requirement is 40%. And there's some commissions and a call money rate. So let's go ahead and work through some of these calculations. So the maximum leverage ratio, one over that 0.4, and that gives us 2.5 as a maximum leverage ratio. So that's an easy calculation, right? All right, let's go ahead and figure out what the return on this margin account is. So what were we in it for? We $50, a thousand shares. So there's $50,000, but that initial margin was 40%. So 40% of 50,000. So we had to show up with 20,000 in cash and we took out a loan of $30,000. Commissions, we take the 1,000 times the 0.05, that gets us $50. So on the when we borrowed, I'm sorry, when we bought these shares, what did I just say a minute ago? We had to show up with $20,000 in cash, but we also had to show up with an extra $50 to pay the commission. So at the end of one year, stock is worth $55, right? We we bought at 50 and sold at 55. So keep in mind, let me repeat this, it's worth repeating, that's a 10% return. Um, however, however, we had to pay the commission, so it really was a gain of just uh, uh, $4,950, plus you had to add in the dividends there, and here's really, this is an important part. We borrowed 30000 and we paid 4%. Here, let me just go back. Notice the reading calls this the call money rate. When I give this example to my students, I just call it the interest rate on the loan, but go ahead and remember that term, call money rate. So take the 30 times the 4%, that gets you 1,200. So think about what's happening here. You know, we made $5,000, but 50 of that was eaten up by the commission. And then 1,200 of that is eaten up by the interest that we have to pay because after all, the lender is not gonna provide us with the $30,000 for free, but then we get some dividend payments in there. And then at the end, we're gonna pay another $50 worth of commission. So uh, the gain on the transaction, look at the second to bottom line there. So we've got the 49.50 plus the 1,000 in dividends minus the uh, 1,200 in interest expense, and then minus the other 50 on the sale. So there's our total profit in the numerator, and then you have to divide that by the equity portion or the cash portion, which is the $20,050. And so that gets you 23.44%. This is the what I call the beauty of leverage, right? You're borrowing money, so this is leverage. You are turning a 10% financial security return, right? We bought at 50 and sold at 55. You're turning a 10% investment into a 23.44% investment because you are using somebody else's capital as part of your original investment. 
This is the beauty of leverage when we turn a 10% into a 23% return, but there is ugliness of leverage as well. If in fact the price would have gone down to $45 instead of up to $55, then a cash account would have been a minus 10%, but then the return would have been a minus 23% or some number around there. That's the ugliest ugliness of leverage. What does leverage do? It magnifies returns both on the positive end and the negative end. Now, of course, what we want to know is if we if we take out a margin and we buy shares of stock, we want to know what happens. What happens if we're going to get a margin call when our investment banker calls us and says, hey, do you remember all that money uh, you borrowed to buy these shares of stock? Well, the price is falling and the price is falling and you don't have enough margin. And so let's go ahead and take a look at a quick example down there. We bought at 30, our maintenance, uh, our margin 25%, leverage ratio is two. Oops, I went one too many. And so let's go ahead, there's the margin call. So price is 30, mar you'll get a margin call at $20. How did we calculate that? Well, the um, leverage ratio of two means that we've got 30 divided by two, so there's 15. So we had 15 of our own cash, call that equity, 15 of the borrowing, call, call that debt. And to get the margin, just take the $15 divided by one minus that maintenance margin. And there you get the, uh, the $20. So that addresses, uh, I think all, whoops, I didn't mean to go ahead. That addresses all of that LOS where we had to calculate. Remember, this is the only LOS that asks us to calculate. So the, these calculations uh, should be okay. All right, moving on to execution, validity, and clearing instructions. All right, let's talk about execution. This is the way I tell my students to visualize this on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Now, remember, it's all electronic, so it doesn't really work this way. But let's suppose that I'm this uh, designated market maker on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. What I do is I tell all the people who want to buy from me to get in this line, and I tell all the people who want to sell to get in this line. And so I have different prices, right? I'm willing to buy low and sell high. So as the designated market maker, I have a built-in, uh, boy, can I call it total profit? Or how about if I could just call it total revenue? So I'm going to win every time here if prices are stagnant. And so uh, the bid price is the price that I'm willing to buy. The ask price is the price that I'm willing to sell. So you have bid and ask, and uh, essentially what happens is that I just get these buyers and sellers together, and I take the difference between the two. Let me go ahead and use just an obvious example. Suppose the bid price is uh, 100 and the ask price is 101, and I have 10 people in each line. Well, I just get these 10 people in line, and I, I transfer 100 over to the one, I transfer the shares over to the other, and I keep a dollar. <laughs> and so I keep doing that, and I keep doing that. And uh, the challenge for me is to make sure that the lines are equal. If the lines are equal, then I'm always making a dollar. But if the lines become unequal, if there are tons of people who want to sell and tons of people who want or tons of people who want to buy, well, then it takes all my skill to be able to change the price and still and still generate a profit. All right, a couple of other definitions. Notice the arrow point there. The highest bid in the market is the best bid. The lowest ask is the best offer. And then the difference between those two is known as the bid ask spread. And remember, even though I might be the only designated market maker on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, I'm competing with people all over the place uh, in other exchanges and on other markets. All right, how about execution? So this is an indication of how the order should be filled. You know, historically, most orders have always been just market orders. And, you know, we'll say something like to our, our wealth manager or our investment banker, we'll say something like, you know what, buy 100 shares of Procter & Gamble uh, and do it as fast as you can and do it uh, over the course of whenever you really want to. So a market order is really an immediate order execution at the best available price. Now, limit orders uh, put some kind of a qualifier in front of the order. The order is, a market order is here, go buy or sell, and you know, uh, do it whenever you can. Uh, 
but do it as quickly as you can and of course find the best price that you can a limit order says something like look i only want you to buy these shares if the price is twenty dollars a share or i only want you to sell these shares if you can do it in the next 27 minutes and so there are different kinds of orders there's so there's a marketable limit order uh, and then the resulting then you have a new best bid uh, and then you can make a market and you have these standing limit orders and then you have all these validity orders uh, that are definitions so a day order good till canceled immediately and so you have all these different kinds of things so it's probably a good idea for you to memorize these definitions uh, if if you haven't already uh, considering what kind of careers you're having. And then what did I say a few moments ago about clearing? There needs to be somebody who's keeping track uh, of all of this stuff. Uh, years ago, uh, before the uh, 2008 financial crisis, and of course, before uh, the COVID, uh, my buddy, uh, who I went to graduate school with, and I, we traveled to Chicago and we spent one day on the, at the Chicago Board of Trade and the next day on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And we met all sorts of traders. It was really a fun group of two days. But we also met some individuals who were in charge of clearing. And uh, they are those individuals who are fairly wealthy or organizations who are fairly wealthy. And what they do is they just keep track of stuff. So that on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, if you took the long position in a futures contract and then somebody else took the short position in that futures contract, well, the clearing, the clearinghouse corporation wrote a contract separately with each of these two individuals or organizations, and they get to set the rules about how you uh, how you settle, whether it's a physical settlement, whether it's a financial or a cash settlement. And, uh, and based on all that stuff, at the end of the day, then uh, the clearing people would say, okay, you owe me this money, you owe me this money, and they keep track of it. And so think of clearing as really just a way of keeping track of stuff. All right, we've already talked a little bit about primary markets. So primary markets are where securities are first sold. That's when they are created. And so initial public offerings are examples of primary markets. Seasoned offerings or secondary offerings. These, of course, are offerings in which publicly held corporations go back into the equity market by issuing new shares of stock. And then secondary markets that we talked about, the New York Stock Exchange. And so this is what I tell my students. I say, look, the New York Stock Exchange, this, this place, this represents the pulse of the free market economy, not only in the United States, but in the entire world. It's only because there exists this highly liquid and highly trustworthy secondary market that primary market transactions are able to be um, uh, affected. So think about this. If I'm a big company like Procter & Gamble and I have a, a new idea for a bar of soap, right? I have, it's, it's got a new molecule in it. And this bar of soap, when you wash, you're going to be clean for a couple of days, right? So I have this idea. I need money today. This is a positive net present value project. So what do I do? I go to the primary market to the investment bankers and the investment bankers say, oh, oh, this is a great idea. Here's all your money. Go ahead and invest in these soap machines. So these shares of stock are created and then the investment bankers then sell them to all their clients. Well, all those clients, they would never buy those securities if they were not convinced that at any day in the future, they could go to the New York Stock Exchange and I'm going to do this in quotes. I don't like to do this and get their money back. And so the fact that the New York Stock Exchange exists, it's the pulse. That's why when I take my students to New York, you know, we visit lots of different places. We go to the NASDAQ Exchange and we've gone to the New York Stock Exchange a bunch of times. But in order to get in there, you have to pass through some pretty intense security because, boy, if there was something bad that would happen on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, like September 11th, it would shut down the entire economy for long time periods. All right, how about the difference between quote driven? These are the over-the-counter markets. And remember, the over-the-counter markets 
get its name really from over the counter. You know, like if you were to have bought a Pacific Railroad bond in 1875 or some year, you would go down to a bank and you would hand over the cash and the banker would actually give you a little coupon book. And to get your, to get your coupon payments or your interest payments, you would have to tear this little thing off, a coupon, right? And you would have to slide it over the counter, you know, in six months and 12 months to actually, uh, to actually get your coupon payment. Now, of course, over the years, you don't really slide anything over the counter. Over the counter markets, you know, were pretty much the originators of the electronic markets. And so that's the way that's the way I think of it is this uh, this quote driven market between and among commercial banks and investment banks and broker dealers or trading houses or just maybe a wealthy uh, a wealthy investor like me. Order driven markets are the, on the other hand, are typically what happens on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Or like in the old days, I took my students to the Philadelphia Stock Exchange. And then you have all exchanges, organized exchanges throughout the world. These are typically order driven markets in which there's an order coming in and then that's matched with another order. And then they try to figure out what is a market clearing price. Now, all of these markets are electronic these days. If you flip on uh, CNBC or Fox Business News and they go to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, there's not a mad house going on uh, like it like it used to be. Uh, how about brokered markets? And look at the second teardrop point in parentheses. We have examples of, you know, real estate properties and fine art masterpieces. And so these brokers arrange trades between and among clients. That's probably a limited number of investors or institutions. And uh, this happens way more regularly than you think, not just for those unique items, but it also occurs for, you know, maybe some uh, shares of stock that may or may not be uh, traded or issued by large corporations. Uh, features of a well-functioning financial system. Uh, boy, these are obvious, right? Timely and accurate disclosures so market participants can make well-informed decisions. Let's pause here for just a second. I'm hoping that you watched the eight or 10 financial statement analysis recordings that I have recently made. And what did we talk about those financial statements? We wanted them to be timely and accurate. We wanted them to reflect the economic condition of that organization. Uh, and we wanted them to have high quality, meaning that the company that is putting together the, these financial statements together with the public accounting firms are not lying to us. All right, so the financial system depends on all that stuff we talked about in those, uh, those old readings. Are you getting a sense of what I'm trying to do in these recordings is I'm trying to link what we're doing in a current reading with readings either before or readings that are kind of come or that will come after because the CFA Institute, at least if I were crafting questions, does a, would do a really good job of linking all of these because each study session is not its own unique silo with a correlation coefficient of zero between and among the other silos. All this stuff is related. That's what we're trying to do. Build the foundation so we have this beautiful castle at the end of our studying. And so when the CFA Institute hands us the level one exam, we're sitting in our castle. And when they ask us a question about timely and accurate disclosures, we can answer the questions as they relate to this LOS, but also as they relate to all of the accounting LOSs. And all we have to do is while we're taking the exam, you get up and walk over to this part of the castle and say, oh yeah, here's the answer. Or walk over to this part of the castle. Oh yeah, here's the answer. Now, of course, you can't really walk up and uh, look uh, at, at uh, all your answers because there are strict rules about taking the exam. We'll talk about those in another, in another uh, recording. Complete markets. So this is what we called it in graduate school. You know, in the old days, you would invest in cash or bonds or equity securities. But now we have this thing called spanning. And that's the word that academics use. We want to span all of the possibilities out there. So as good wealth managers, when we have a client who has a super unique risk and return objective, we can span 
all of these markets and reach in and pick something out. Like, well, what did I say early? The James Bond uh, bathing suit. That might be that might be perfectly appropriate for just one of our clients, but totally inappropriate for uh, every other one of our clients. Uh, external or informational efficiency. We're going to talk about Eugene Fama and the efficient markets hypothesis throughout the CFA program. And so in summary, what Eugene Fama taught us was that prices reflect all relevant information and that prices change when those pieces of relevant information change. Fundamental information, information that's specific to each company and information that is general to the economy. All right, objectives of market regulation are right, to control fraud, that makes sense, to control agency problems. Oh my gosh, this is going to be so super important for us when we talk about the agency uh, uh, conflict and then we talk about all the professional standards. What we want to do is we want to avoid conflicts of interest and we want to say something like, all right, we're going to regulate this market so that everybody is fairly treated. And I'll give you the example. You've been watching some of my videos. You'll know I'm a great sports fan. The next time you watch an NBA game, watch the initial jump ball. And the referee goes up and he goes like this. He or she goes like this and throws it up. And inevitably, the ball either goes this way or that way. And the two centers, you know, and these are in the NBA, these are huge men. And they're throwing their hands in each other. It's a totally unfair uh, jump ball. And so I have my own theories on, on how to do this in basketball to make it more fair. I think we should start every basketball game like they do lacrosse. <laughs> All right, so to promote fairness, to set mutually beneficial standards, and, oh my gosh, look at that last one here, prevent undercapitalized firms from taking excessive risk. That sounds an awful lot like we need to regulate the market to prevent <laughs> individuals and organizations from harming themselves without knowing it. But I'm going to go ahead and say this right now. Look, I teach my students all the time and I say this in these recordings regularly. As good wealth managers, we need to identify the risks, we need to quantify the risks, and then we need to manage the risks. So if we do those three things, there shouldn't be such a thing as taking excessive risk. Now let me go back to the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, uh, a lot of these firms, they accomplished all but three of those things. And that's a good way to end there on a little bit of a comedy note. So uh, what are important ones? I'm going to go ahead and try not to pick out any individual LOSs that are more important than others. I'm going to go ahead and say something like, look, each one of these LOSs is a brick and we're laying that brick as a foundation so we can do more stuff. So my advice is to go through this reading, make sure you understand all the definitions and the applications, put that in the back burner inside of your brains because future readings are going to call on us to reach into our brain and extract something out. Now, I'm also going to give you advice that I do pretty regularly is take a look at the 50 or so end of reading questions inside of the CFA reading. Work through those questions and then go through all of our practice questions here for this one. I'm guessing you probably only have to go through them one time so that you can remember how this works. Okay, hey, thank you for watching. Have a, uh, have a great day and good luck studying.